Hi everyone, I'm Martin Aziz. I uh, work for a company called Loyalty One. And my name is Fernando Cuenca. I'm from Toronto, Canada, same as Martin. I had the good fortune of working with Martin and many of the folks of Loyalty One, who some of them are here on the, in the room today, uh, as part of the transformation journey. And, uh, yeah, your oh. Let's try now. What about now? All right, so who can repeat what I just said? Okay, <laughs> let's start again. <laughs> something, something, Canada, working together. <laughs> yeah, beautiful friendship. That was the yeah. end of the story, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, it's... I, I feel like there was a bit of a theme uh, dur during the last two days. Uh, not the theme, but a one of the themes around, you know, thinking about problems of organizations that go beyond team problems, right? And so we're kind of going to pile on to that same narrative, but it's interesting you see different angles on, on that discussion. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, in a kind of in a, in a sideways organizational flow, we're going to talk about uh, our experience um, and really why we're going to try and make a case about end-to-end -end flow and flow across your entire organization is something that just about everyone should be worrying about if you're you know, in any kind of complex business. So uh, I'll start by just kind of giving a bit of a background and history of you know, our, our story, and it starts in 2013. Uh, 2013, um, Loyalty One is um, a world-leading loyalty marketing company. Um, it's got about, uh, at that point, a uh, 20-year history. It's growing every year. It's doing really well. Um, things couldn't be better, but things started to slow down. And uh, there was kind of a slow realization, not everywhere, but in pockets of the organization, that things needed to change. Um, my role at the time there was the uh, the director of the PMO, so I kind of live, there was a, there was a, who did the session with the CPI and the SPI, I think it was you guys over there. Yeah, when I saw that, I was just started to sweat, it was like, <laughs> take me back to those days. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we had uh, this organization whose identity was uh, growth, right, that's, that's how we were. And uh, we had uh, managed projects, we had some consistent outcomes. Um, you know, heavily PMI based. Uh, but if we were being honest with, our, with ourselves, you know, we really kind of delivered our work based on heroics, teams or individuals, that sort of thing. Maybe a bit of luck and probably a lot of money spent. Uh, so our outcomes were kind of all over the place and uh, we needed to, to, to shift. And we did that somewhere in the boundaries between 2013 and 2014. Um, really a big, punctuation point to our equilibrium. Really just kind of changing things up. Um, project management was something that we did away with. We went full scrum. Um, quite a number of teams. Uh, no more projects. And, you know, it wasn't a bad story, right? I'm not here to kind of pile onto scrum or, or say bad things about it. Um, there was a lot of improvement, there was a lot of inward looking things and uh, you know uh, it's felt like we were heading really on the right direction there and uh, things started to improve. Uh, but you know if, if we were looking at it beyond just outcomes from teams and looking at our business problems, were those better? Well, still not good enough, right? And, you know, the phenomenon around teams was something that was interesting. And at the time, we, we kind of didn't realize there were some sort of spin-off effects of tribes. And we're going to get into that a little, a little bit later um, around how identities start to form around teams and what that means for your business. Uh, but the idea was, as, as we were kind of leaving 2015 and going into 2016, we realized we needed to do something more. And what was that something more? Where, where are we going to go next? Because it seems like this has only got us so far, and we'll need to try uh, uh, something else. So uh, that story is kind of still ongoing, but we're going to 
kind of tell you sort of our sense making of, of the last last couple of years. So he pods a little bit of marketing there, just sort of get you into this session because you're curious what pea pods are. Uh, but pea pods was this kind of phenomena that uh, I started to notice uh, really over the last couple of years as we started to get really serious about collecting more data about how we were delivering our services. And uh, the pea pod here you're seeing is actually a cumulative flow diagram. It's just a very simple cumulative flow diagram. Um, but we looked at project initiative after initiative, and they seem to have the same shape. Uh, I remember a time I had a bunch of senior leaders in a room, and I put the CFD up, and then I asked them, it was like kind of a quiz, which initiative do you think this was? Like A, B, C, or D? And then uh, it was a trick question because it was all of them. Right? So we are now converging on a very stable delivery pattern. Very sta so if you're looking for stability, great. Uh, and the good news was there was an order of magnitude shift. So if we looked at our previous projects, the metric we would use would be years. You know, is it a one and a half year project, two year, one year? That was the number that you would naturally gravitate towards. Uh, and we had moved that metric to months. So good news. Right? We should just kind of you know, pat ourselves on the back, and that's it. We've done it. You know, maybe pop some champagne, and off you go. Uh, but if, you, if, um, if we look at things objectively, our market had changed as well. This was not fit for our market. So good news is we're improving, um, but not well enough. Right? There, there's still a gap between where our market where our market is uh, expecting us to be if we're going to be competitive and the actual improvements we had. So this was kind of a look into the uh, delivery side of new things or enhancements, new products and that sort of thing. Uh, also during that time, we kind of looked at uh, our operational services. And so that wasn't Peapods. That had a different name. Uh, that was soup kitchens. Like think of your kind of Depression era soup kitchens. Like you can even close your eyes and you're there, right? You're like um, not a good place to be. Not for the customers. It, you know, you got this endless line, and am I am I even going to get in before they close up? And probably not very good for the people inside too, as they're just trying to get the soup out, right? Just misery everywhere. So not a not a happy place for either the company or your customers, right? And so, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, CFD we have here is just, you know, an example of one of many areas of services where just things start to just pile up and pile up and eventually you just give up, right? You're, the, the options expire before you have a chance to look at them. And so there's a, there's a real business hit uh, from that. So uh, why is this happening, right? We've, you know, we've... We've gone agile. We've taken it very seriously. Um, we've invested in all of that, right? Why is this happening, right? Um, we've, you know, we've improved our capability, right? No, we're, there's some high utilization going on here, right? Uh, the team's improved, right? Uh, but the business re results are inside there, right? Success for the squirrel, the poor little squirrel here, um, is getting at the, uh, the feed inside there, right? So, uh, <laughs> so the answers are not obvious, right? And so um, the next part of our presentation, we're trying to kind of deconstruct and understand things and see what we need to do about it. Okay, so Fernando, what, what should we do? All right, so... If you try to answer these questions, so maybe a place to start is how we look at things. That, so we can continue with the ideas that Andy Carmichael brought up today. So the idea of, well, everything will depend which lens you use to see things and how you interpret things. So what we're going to do next is to walk you through a series of things we started observing, things we learned to observe, learn to see. And, you know, maybe some of those, thing, those things were already there all along. The thing is we started looking at them differently and interpreting them differently. 
Perhaps in your environments you will see things that are similar. But we'll try to walk you through the, um, the thinking process that was behind that things we observed and what interpretations we, we could have. So good place to start perhaps is, well, let's, let's look at the organization as a whole. We can see or look at the organization as a large delivery system. So as, a, as all systems, they have some sort of input, some sort of, some sort of output, and a process in between. The input is the needs or requests that are coming from customers or sends from customers. The output is in the form of products or services. In the middle, you have some sort of process, intellectual type of work that is done, performed by a group of people. So this group of people need to have some internal structure. Uh, organizations need to somehow decentralize control, manage capacity. So what is the, what is the model for that? Well, the, the prevalent way of doing that is usually organizing smaller cells, teams, work groups. As Mar Martin was mentioning at the time, this was uh, the, the, the prevalent way of seeing things was Scrum. So this ended up being mostly Scrum teams, although it wasn't just Scrum. There, were, there was some, some sort of team level camp and there was some groups doing an ad hoc process. The point is that you have these individual cells, each of them having some sort of internal process, roles, responsibilities, cross-functionality, and all that. Now, uh, somehow we need to interface those things with that external world. So in this case, this means that, or based on this framework, we mean, it means we, we have this line of product owners acting as the interface in between the teams and the, and the customers. The role of these people essentially is to understand what the customers need, they establish a relationship, they understand their needs, they somehow agree on, on deliverables. And, uh, well, they, they develop a, an understanding of what it, what it means to, to be fit for them. What, what are their needs? So while all that is happening, teams are learning to use their, or, or to work within the, for example, the Scrum framework or any other team level framework. Now, the, what, what we can start looking at when we look at from, from this particular lens is that because the, the approach is very team-centric. It tends to be very inwards looking. So we talk a lot about in Scrum about how teams will run continuously improving, but it's always inwards looking, how the team can improve. And what ends up happening is teams develop improvement strategies that are very localized. Not only that, they develop their own identities. There is a tribal aspect that starts growing where each team develops their own rituals, their own um, practices, their own identity, not sense of identity. In the meantime, customers on their side start to see some improvement. So as, as this inwards looking improvement happens, in the organization as a whole improves as well. But there are some lingering concerns that still remain. So some people start asking, where is my staff? Um, in, it, what happened to me? When am I going, when am I going to get this? So it, it's usually two types of concerns. Transparency about the status of the work, where is it? And uncertainty about delivery. But at the same time, it's not the same for everybody. There are, there are some teams, there are some external customers for whom the system works fine. So it's, it's very um, uneven. So the other thing you can look at is, what's the nature of the demand here? Because perhaps one of the assumptions we make when we, we have team level approaches is that teams work on one type of work. They, you know, we just do user stories here, right? But if you look at how the work actually comes in, you will find that it comes in many shapes. It's very different. So for example, first it comes from different places. So not everybody in the organization is the same. Some people have different status, different authority, different levels of view, different levels of context. So it, the, the origin matters. The size, the type is different, depending on where it comes. Different frequencies of arrival. So it doesn't neatly come at the end of every sprint. Sometimes it comes in between. Some people expect to just send you work once a year. Uh, different levels of urgency, different uh, categories of risk, or sometimes even different, different perceived value. So, what do we make of this? Well, um, so Braveheart, that's the first thing I could think of when I thought of tribes, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, there's this idea of, you know, uh, teams pursuing some form of local agenda. Um, but, you know, is it a problem? And um, at this point, it's not necessarily clear that it is. So um, as kind of Fernando is talking about the story, I'm going to kind of give an alternate version of that same story. 
So that's why there's kind of two of us here. Um, he tells his story, and I kind of retell it. And I'm going to use a causal loop to talk about the retell of the story. So the only thing that I know right now um, is, you know, Fernando kind of suggested there's some complexity or problem that is amplifying the fact that we need a bunch of teams to do it. It's not a simple thing to do. Um, and we need some way to get those teams productive and think about, you know, getting things done and there's some cohesion. So uh, those teams are going to amplify some form of tribal behavior and they're going to use that towards good things, like improving. Uh, but I will qualify it, it's very local, right? So that tribalism is going to help them improve, it's going to give them energy, cohesion, but there is some form of localization of effort. Is it a good or a bad thing? Well, let's, let's, let's look at it a little bit closer. Um, so, you know, at the start, you know, as I was talking about pea pods, you know, there was, a, there was a clear fitness criteria for us, and that was time to market. Our lead time was essentially something that we really needed to improve. Um, and I mean, arguably, you know, it's not the only fitness criteria for companies, but it's probably one of the universal ones. Most companies have to worry about uh, how long uh, it takes for things to get, to get to their customers. So, you know, the, the complexity of the problem was kind of the root of Fernando's talk. Um, does it have a link to lead time? Well, we haven't established that link yet, but we will. Right, um, and for us, fitness is a quicker lead time, so we've established that link. Keep that in mind as we kind of sort of build on this this causal loop. All right. So what's next? Some other thing we can look at is the nature of commitment. So it, if you're familiar with the word of Scrum, we talk a lot about teams making commitments about delivery and all that. But the thing is, we can also see other types of commitments that are happening. When, when it comes to delivery. And the important thing is that the commitment that really, really matters, which is the commitment to the customer that's outside, well, that happens really, really upstream respect to the teams. So teams like live here, they make commitments here, but guess what? The actual commitment with customers actually happen way, way upstream respect to them. So, and even sometimes between different sets of people. So this is product owner team conversation. This is involves usually senior stakeholders. That's where the commitment happens. And we say, yes, we're going to deliver this. Now, if this happens upstream, something we notice, or what you can start seeing in this picture, is that from there, the commitment is pushed down. So from there, the commitment gets to the team eventually, and that ends up forming a queue. So this commitment, because it's a push situation in, in place, ends up accumulating in front. And we see these piles of things that are accumulating in front of teams as they come to access the work. So what do you make of that? So uh, the photo of the, uh, the soup kitchen was uh, taken in our previous slide. So this was kind of the next best one I could choose. This is a clear cut forest. And we got our uh, brave little tree here, the last survivor here. Uh, but that's kind of the theme I want to sort of project on you, right? So there's this disconnection between commitments and capacity, right? So hey, you know, yeah, we'll do this. Can we? And what's the effect of getting that wrong? Right? Once, twice, a few times. Um, so this is um, increasing your potential of overburdening, right? The lineup we saw at the soup kitchen, right? You don't know if it's going to happen. So this is not saying for sure it's going to be overburdened, but it's going to increase the likelihood that that's a possibility, right? So there's two things here, right? So the fact that a commitment is made implicitly, so there hasn't been a very conscious act to do it, and the distance between the work, where the work was being done doesn't have a very good signal to say, hey, yeah, we're, we're ready to do this, right? So a bit of a challenge. Um, are we done? Is there more? No, that's actually more. All right, there's more. So we had lots of things, right? And one of the 
perhaps one of the ideas we have is that these teams represent independent cells, and we sometimes even call them that they are cells. But the thing is, as all cells are, they are all connected. So there are, we, can, we started seeing this phenomenon we started calling the white space problem, which is the interconnections of these teams, which sometimes are not as very obvious. For example, teams sometimes form chains. So teams cannot deliver on their own, they depend on some other teams, so work keeps going from one to the next to the next to the next before it comes out. In other cases, uh, some teams act as services for other teams, so work needs to go there and come back before it can keep going. In other cases, you have things like shared team members because there are special uh, expertise that you need, it may be anti-economical to have one of these people for every team. Or you can have people who, people who move around or dependence on external, um, external team members or external teams. The point, the point here is that there are lots of things happening in between teams. So teams will report, for example, problems and impediments. And many times those impediments are coming not directly from the team but from the white space in between, which most of the times is not really on their realm of control or, or even responsibility. Right? So they're white space problems. They're problems in between. That's what Christopher Avery used. So they happen somewhere in between. So what do we make of that? Um, maybe we found that link. So, you know, you talked about overburdening. You talked about white spaces. They're going to do. They're going to have an effect, right? So, um, you know, we're at a Kanban conference. So, there's got to be some talk about flow efficiency at some point. And here it is. Uh, so overburdening, right? We saw that. That's obvious, right? Too much in your system. That's going to that's going to have effect on your flow efficiency. Uh, number of teams. It's a reality of the complexity that we talked about. Um, that's going to happen, right? If you're uh, in a business doing something serious, that's going to happen, right? Uh, so you're going to have the white spaces, and so that's going to be your second uh, dampener on flow efficiency, right? And so flow efficiency is now constraining lead time, and now that's constraining your fitness as a company. So um, we've made that first link. Uh, the other thing is, um, Fernando talked a little bit about you know, some, some challenges on the batch sizes, right? So uh, batch size, how big of a chunk of work we take on, right? And um, so there's some pressure there too, right? We got all these teams. There's all this coordination costs to, to make that a reality. We, may, we have to make that economically efficient, right? We can't just go in and release something small because the ratio between that coordination uh, and how much we were released has to make some sort of economic sense. So you kind of have uh, a bit of a reinforcing loop. Right? So you have these transaction costs that tend to make you want to cre increase your batch size, but then the batch size has a lot of overhead to tend to increase your transaction costs. Uh, did I talk about the batch size too? So you're kind of, you're kind of in this reinforcing loop situation. Uh, that's going to amplify your lead time as well. And for those of you who have sort of thought about you know, the dark matter and the expansion of of initiatives and where's all this scope coming from, it's probably a good clue to say there's something around that reinforcing loop that seems to be feeding the dark matter that tends to, you know, if, if you've been on any kind of initiative, chances are, you know, uh, I'll talk to me afterwards, if you're one of the few people that have seen scope stay where it was when you started, I'd like to have that conversation, right? Uh, maybe you've you found the magic formula, but chances are it's going to grow and there's some cause for that. Right, so you know, uh, and I'm not suggesting this is the only one, but it's it's a good one that we've we made a made a link to. So yeah, we're done, right? Or is there more? No, there is actually more. Oh, there is one more. So the problem of decomposition. So we all know that it's a good idea to take large pieces of work and decompose them in small pieces, more manageable chunks, right? Uh, so that's all good. And no, some, something we could observe here though is that this decomposition usually tends to happen on this side. So product owners talk to customers in their language. They understand each other. At some point, we need to decompose. Well, this decomposition tends to happen in a way that is more inwards looking again. So it's for tactical reasons. 
usually disconnected from these people. That's one thing. But there was one, one more thing we discovered that is, uh, th this was more surprising, actually. So what happens with the recognizability of the, of the pieces? So what gets from here to here, it gets decomposed. But when it hits the teams, it gets further decomposed, usually. Teams decompose that for usually technical reasons now. Because it makes sense to implement this with that, and because we have to put them together, or something like that. So the, the net result of all this decomposition sequence is that the little chunks we end up talking about in our standards, in our planning, and everything, is unrecognizable from this side. It's disconnected from the original request. So this lack of, or that connection between um, decomposition and recognizability was an interesting um, thing to see. So what do you make of that? So, you know, so we have to have decomposition. It's kind of our coping mechanism to deal with all the work. You can't do it all in one piece. So it's a reality. So the question is not about, you know, whether we do it, but just how, right? So the, you know, so let's, let's bring the cause loop with us. You know, I promised this is the last one on it, but let's bring the cause loop into frame, right? So uh, you've already seen this. This is just a recap. I've just added two more elements, okay? So, you know, you have this need of decomposition, lots of teams, complexity, that's brought that forward. Um, what it's done is dampened your customer recognizability. So you've, you're losing your link to your customer. So think about all the energy towards improvements. Improve to what, right? So you need that link in terms of what the services you're providing to your customers to understand what it is that you need to improve. So there's a connection there. Um, and as you think about how, how the flow of your work goes, um, you need to know where, where the goals are, right? So there's other things around constraints and stuff that we talked about. But the recognizability um, seems to be something very interesting that we that wasn't quite intuitive um, when we first started to look at this. So let's kind of bring this back. Let's understand the peapod a little bit more, right? So this was kind of investigation until now, right? We were just we see these pea pods, we don't know why, right? And so we have to discover that, and that's kind of you know taking you through some of the thinking over the last little while. We don't know why, so now we have an understanding why, right? So dark matter revealed during long batch, batch size has a high transaction cost which creates more transaction cost. And we have these awesome scrum teams or even con local Kanban teams, and they can deliver like clockwork. But it's not recognizable by the customer, so you have to batch it up. That's going to be your time. So this is uh, the challenge. So step one is know what's, what's creating it. How are we going to solve it? So we realized that, uh, well, the problem is on the system side, right? We can't go in and say, we need to be better teams or we have to make better decisions. Uh, our dear Mr. Squirrel here, um, in order for him to get into the, uh, the, the little feeder there, is going to have to have some help in the system. So these are changes that we've looked at and say, okay, well, are the changes that we need to do kind of localized in nature, right? Is it a part of a functional department or something else? No, they're, they're an organizational problem, right? These are something for the company. The company is the, is the entity that delivers the services, not an individual department, right? So uh, knowing the system problem, how do, we, how do we deal with it? Well, we'll have to introduce some form of countermeasure, right? And I think there are lots of options, um, but uh, for us, you know, there were some immediate obvious ones. Um, and you know, th the cool thing is most of them are pretty much from the Kanban toolkit, right? The options are available, right? The question is, you know, when, when, where do you need to apply them? And how are they actually going to affect you? So, you know, if you think about service orientation, the whole uh, agenda there, that helps with recognizability. Um, constraints, 
You know, a lot of this to deal with overburdening, explicit policies, uh, moving to pull, making that connection between your capacity and what's being promised. Uh, and finally, measuring, actually having an idea of what's going on, right? So that's going to sort of get you into that whole movement of actually doing something about this, right? Um, ignoring these things at the system level essentially means we're going to have pea pods for life, right? And do we want that? So let's kind of look at it from a model that we kind of built to reflect the, um, the causal loop that we've had so far. So this is kind of how work gets done. We have this early commitment without any connection to capability. We have some form of unconstrained demand. Work gets deconstructed into things that are not easily recognizable. And then off it goes to teams who have to coordinate and work and work until sufficient work has been done and accumulated to get to the customer. And it works. It just takes a long time, right? It works, right? And, you know, if, if we had been in a market where, you know, the seven to nine month Peapod was fit, we're done. Job's over. It's a fit system. So it works, but does it work well enough? So to, to get uh, away from this, we kind of need to look at a bit of a different model. Right? So this is where we look at the whole organization and suggest something else. Well, part of the disconnect we saw was a lot of work coming in and requests are essentially being done one after the other. Um, there is not a very good mechanism to consider what do we do now, what do we do later, what do we say no to. So uh, the idea is you need to shape demand somehow, right? So ideas, I kind of like think of those, they're, they're like bums. Everyone has at least one idea, right? They're fairly cheap too, right? Um, so ideas come in, um, but that does, that's not the cue to work on it, right? You need some, something else. So uh, from ideas, you get some options that maybe are good ones. Um, but then you need to sort of think about options that you're actually going to do. And then finally, should I have capacity? This is the one I'm going to do next, right? So you're kind of having this funnel that's sort of closing in and making it very specific, right? I like there was, an, there was a question about, you know, um, that comes up with models like this, right? How do you sort your, sort your queue? There is no queue, right? There is the option that makes, makes sense for this moment in time, right? Should we have capacity? Um, the other thing is you're now going into trying to understand uh, what your your capacity is so you're, there's some form of constraint at the organization level in terms of if we are going to pull when is that when is that going to occur so you have some form of constrained delivery pipeline and then you're thinking about progress right and I think An Andy was uh, was talking about you know the stages of of, of uh, knowledge development in his talk earlier but that's basically it right you're you're moving on and you're, it's still recognizable. I'm just, you know, it's not about um, progress on the de deconstructed work, but progress on something that's recognizable for your customer. And then finally, that recognizability also allows you to uh, align improvements that are focused on your services and ultimately your customers and value, right? So this is kind of, the model that we start to say, okay, well, we really need to go here, right? We know that we're working the other way, and if we stay that way, it's, it's the multi-month delivery pattern, right? And it's pea pods. And for us, this is the way we get away from it. So you can't really work off of model. We have to actually put a board together. And so um, the idea here is now looking at a board for the enterprise, right? And I think the, the big piece for this is realizing that we have to manage overburdening throughout the organization. It's not sort of a localized thing, and it's not necessarily an organization-wide thing. It's everywhere. So we kind of looked at it from the perspective of there are really three spots. Uh, the organization itself can be overburdened. The individual services provided can be overburdened. 
And then ultimately those services are being provided by individuals and teams and they too can be overburdened. So constraints actually need to exist throughout that. So um, going over some of the major sections, we saw that sort of constrained pipe. So this is the area that we try to shape our demand going from infinite ideas to good options, to things that are constrained, and these are the ones we're going to do next. Uh, we started to organize our services around work streams. So really thinking about what our core uh, deliverables of the company and getting a sense of their capacity so that we could pull. Then uh, as work gets done by teams, maintaining that recognizability at all times, right? So the idea is, what are we working on? It's a, it's, it's a portion of this. We understand the value. There's not too many because we've we fixed the constraint at, at the organization level. The service itself is constrained, and now the teams have that, uh, that same level of constraint. And then finally, you have that feedback loop at the end, right? So, you know, these are early days for us, but we don't know if we got this right. Right, some of the uh, the the selection criteria could be off. Um, how are we going to know that? Right, um, there might be all sorts of services that are are challenged. So um, this this last bit is something that you know, uh, if we're honest, we've never done in the history of a company. It's kind of been always fire and forget. Right, so you know, get it get it out the door, get it out the door. It's out. Oh, thank God, and then we'll move on to the next thing. So this sort of a bit of a pause to say, okay, we have to go in there because it's not only paying attention to are we making money, but you know, how, how did our thinking affect that? And do we need to change our thinking? So, Fernando, it's about eliminating a pods, right? Right. So, what are the four key things to remember to take away from this talk then? So, first is Look beyond your teams. And that has been the theme of this conference. I think there has been many talks about this idea of, well, teams are great and they are important, but we need to look beyond that. Look at the end-to-end -end flow and pay specific attention to those things that happen in between, the problems of white spaces. So look beyond, learn to see other things beyond the team. Uh, overburdening is a problem everywhere. So you need to constrain throughout the enterprise, right? Um, yeah, you're going to get flow in bits and Places, but if you can think about the whole company, um, you're you're you are going to get sort of the movement away from those pea pods. Um, next, understand the nature of commitment. Figure out where your commitments are actually made. What's the distance between that and what work actually happens? What different type of commitments there might be, and commit based on your some sort of capacity signal. So that is, you know, demand is balanced with capability. Otherwise, you will, you will get into the overburdening problem. And, uh, and finally, we're really, really focused on this idea of customer recognizability at all times, right? So, you know, you're, you're thinking about evolutionary change, continuously improving, but maintaining that site allows you to channel that in the right direction. So a very, very important last bit for us. And uh, that's it, right? Dad, thank you so much. Thank if you. If there's any questions, we'll take them out.